How are you all this, this morning? Happy Sabbath and glad to be here. Um, and thank you for the privilege of your time once again. Uh, let's, let's just bow our heads for prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you for this Sabbath day you've given to us. Um, we're grateful that we can come together. Um, it's been raining, it's been cloudy, it's been dreary, and yet you gave us the, the oomph to come here to worship you and to fellowship with our brothers and sisters. And so we want to sense your, fe- your, 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 your presence today, Lord. We ask that you, um, you be with us, that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts again and minds to give us understanding. So thank you for this time. Um, we ask that you speak for me, through me, that your name be glorified. And we thank you. We come in Jesus' name. Amen. It was January 1942. It would have been an amazing holiday season with Christmas gone and the promise of the new year ahead. To many, however, all hopes and dreams and aspirations were gone. Less than a month after invading the Philippine Islands, triumphant Japanese forces occupied the city of Manila. And so it was a perplexing time for the Filipinos. You see, the United States had liberated the Philippines from the hands of Spain for 300 years, just less than 50 years ago. And the the United States had, had established themselves as a friendly governor of the islands and a true ally to the Philippines. And so when the Japanese invaded the Philippines, less than 50 years later, the whole scenario repeated itself. But the Japanese authorities, however, tried to appease the people and enlist the cooperation of the Filipinos. They launched programs designed to transfer the Filipino loyalty from the United States to Japan. In their propaganda, the Japanese linked themselves to the Filipinos as Oriental people with a common enemy, the white-skinned, arrogant American exploiters. And they made glowing promises, the best of which was a complete Philippine independence three years before the United States had planned to do so. They worked hard in winning over the Filipinos. They organized Japanese and Filipino cultural exchanges and established the local language Tagalog as the official language along with Japanese. But under all the veneer of peace and reconciliation, they revealed themselves as callous oppressors. They controlled the press, they curtailed religion, and they made it a capital offense to listen to foreign broadcasts and beat and tortured civilians whom they suspected of subversive activities. And some forced themselves on local women or slapped the locals if they failed to bow in their presence. I remember my mother was telling me when she was a young girl that the Japanese were brutal and cruel. And my father, when he was a young man, related a story to me about how these soldiers rounded up these young men in one town and tortured some of them. And they also rounded up rounded up a family that they captured for some reason, and they were publicly beheaded. And so the Filipinos distrusted and hated them. Can I have my first slide, please? So a little bit of a history. Shortly after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in December 7, 1941, within hours, they turned themselves they, 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 they turned their attention to the Philippines, actually December 8th, the next day. So when, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, 2,400, over 2,400 uh, servicemen lost their lives. Um, 300 planes were decimated. Over 20 naval vessels were destroyed completely. And so when they Within 12 hours, they turned their attention to the Philippines, and the Japanese bombed Manila, just like they did at Pearl Harbor. 
And so in less than three weeks, Bataan and Corridor fell, and they marched right into Manila unmolested. And the United States Commanding General of the Pacific, Douglas MacArthur, was ordered by President Roosevelt to leave and head to Australia. When barely escaped that night, he arrived in Australia, the pr and he said, the President of the United States ordered me to break through Japanese lines, and I came through, and I shall return. And so MacArthur's promise of liberation gave the Filipinos great hope, and they were united in their trust in General MacArthur. One guerrilla leader said, we had total faith in the American promise to come back. We never faltered in our hope. But when the American forces fully surrendered in May of 1942, MacArthur's pledge to return seemed, at best, a valiant dream. And so despair and anguish set in the people. They were enraged by public beatings, torture, and beheadings, and the humiliating order to bow to the Japanese soldiers as they passed. And so in this escalating anger and resentment, Dozens of guerrilla groups sprang up to resist the conquerors. Every major island had at least a few budding resistance groups. But the guerrillas' most important asset was the, was the geography of the Philippines. Because if you look at it, you know, the Philippines is an archipelago. And uh, the jungle interiors of the large islands were natural strongholds, mountainous and generally roadless, with large unmapped areas and too dangerous to penetrate for the Japanese. And the Philippines had a, a coastline of a, over 11,000 miles. And so the, the inhabitants knew every cove and inlet, and they were able to move freely about those areas. And all guerrilla groups were united by patriotism and growing sense of nationalism. In addition, a lot of the Americans that didn't surrender to the Japanese uh, went into hiding, and these were crucial, these played a crucial role in training the guerrillas. And so a network of communication was set up between groups, and MacArthur, who was in Australia, had never lost contact with the Filipino people. And so the plan was to recapture the whole archipelago. And by 1944, the American submarines were shuttling back and forth into the islands, bringing supplies, and American planes returned to the Philippine skies. And the order that the guerrillas were waiting for finally came in the fall of 1944. Unleash maximum violence against the enemy. And so when MacArthur landed in Leyte in 1944, it was an amazing moment because, see this picture right here? <laughs> they didn't have any photographers at that time, so they had to do it all over again. That means the reinvasion or the recapture of the, of the islands were totally unobstructed. So when MacArthur, MacArthur came to the Philippines, he said, people of the Philippines, I have returned by the grace of the almighty God of our forces, stand again on Philippine soil. The hour of your redemption is here. Your patriots have demonstrated an unswerving and resolute devotion to the principles of freedom. For the future generations of your sons and daughters, strike. In the name of your sacred dead, strike. Let no heart beat faint. Let every arm be steeled. So he eventually recaptured the whole country, and the United States eventually defeated Japan by dropping two atomic bombs, one in Nagasaki and the other one in Hiroshima. You know, this has been one of the most incredible rescue mi missions ever recorded in our world history. And as for me, it's probably one of the most special. But have you ever wondered what you would die for? What do you value most in your life? Your family, freedom, freedom from oppressors, 
the love of God. You know, at peacetime, you know, we don't really think about much of, you know, what's happening around us. But when the situation, we're, 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 when placed in a situation where, where the most valuable things are taken away, in the most trying situation, what do you do? I mean, think of the war in Ukraine and Gaza. We just don't have any idea what it's like, do we? You know, I, I, I told this story because I believe that, um, there are spiritual lessons we can learn from it. And I want to share three things this morning. First, <clears throat> you know, the resolute determination and the unswerving belief that the, of the people that MacArthur was going to come back. You know, those three thrilling words, I shall return, it rang loud in the hearts and minds of the Filipino people. You know, it gave them impetus to hang on, to resist the Japanese brutality. And their hope was latched on that promise that MacArthur gave them. You know, hope is amazing. You know, it's, it's really this confident expectation and desire to, you know, for something good to happen in the future. And it carries no doubt. It carries no doubt. It's a sure foundation upon which we base our lifestyle, our lives, believing that the promise is going to happen. It keeps you wanting to continue to live. How is it for us? Can we come to that point where we don't or cannot falter in our confidence in God? Can we be unshakable in our faith? I mean, think about it. Or does it rattle our faith when we go through a crisis? In other words, how do we come to the belief that come what may, our minds are stayed on Jesus? You know, in Isaiah 26, three and four, it says, thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Despite hitting a deer, despite our nephew falling off the stairs, or despite my wife hitting her elbow, despite losing a job, losing a family member. How do we keep that perfect peace? Because he trusteth in thee, trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. I mean that, you know, to me that is so hard. I don't know about you. I don't know where you are in your faith. Which brings me to my second point. How did this confidence come about? Well, just a bit of a background on General Douglas MacArthur. You know, growing up in, in the American Southwest, he, he prepared to, to follow his father's footsteps. But it was really in his mother that instilled in him a conviction that he was destined for greatness in the service to others. You know, after graduating at the head of his class at West Point in 1903, Lieutenant MacArthur was sent to the Philippines. And recalling his first glimpse of the islands, he said, they fastened me with a grip that never relaxed. He became popular, and he cultivated friendships with the wealthy and the important people of the Philippines. There he is when he was a young man. But it was amazing, he was like an idol to the Filipinos. This is a picture of Manila Hotel. It's one of the most uh, beautiful hotels in the Philippines, but it, it's, it's, it has a traditional look to it, and uh, it won the, the most beautiful lobby award internationally. Because it, if you go into the lobby, it's made out of wood. Uh, it, it's just beautiful. And it's well preserved. Anyway, MacArthur lived there. He had his own suite. It was called the General MacArthur Suite. And they, they fed him there, they housed him there, because they loved him. You know, and, and he, like I said, he was like an idol to them. 
But he wanted to build the country in many ways and set up a strong military base in the Southeast Pacific. And so the Filipinos loved the Americans because they were generally uh, treated well. You know, and that's why the Philippines is an English-speaking country, because the United States was friendly to them, as opposed to the Japanese and the Spaniards. You know, both colonizing countries were brutal and cruel. You know, think about it. Spain ruled the Philippines for 300 years, and yet the people did not adopt Spanish as, as their sec second language. And so if you go to any corner in the, in the Philippines, people will be able to communicate and understand you. I mean, my wife can attest to that. You know, when, well, right before we went to the Philippines, for the, fr the first time I took her to the Philippines, you know, she was trying to learn all these Tagalog phrases, but when she got there, people started talking to her in English. So, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the Philippine government is patterned after the three branches of the U.S. government. So, you know, the, the Philippines really loved America. But when MacArthur escaped to Australia, he never stopped caring for the Philippines. In fact, you know, he would send these um, advertising ice, uh, items such as cigarette packs with both, you know, the Philippine and, and the United States flag, you know, stressing the ties between the two countries. And they also had uh, buttons that, you know, with a quote that said, I shall return on it. And so this was extremely, extremely successful. Even with Filipinos who knew no English, they could repeat these three thrilling words, I shall return. But it was MacArthur's extreme devotion and faithfulness for the betterment of the country that won the trust and confidence in the Filipino people. And it was MacArthur's will that really became the impetus for the recapture of the islands. So he revealed himself to be a friend and a defender and cared for their well-being and future that really solidified their trust. So let me ask you a question. Can God be trusted? I mean, it's a rhetorical question, but think about it. If you can trust a human person, a human being, that much, can you trust God even more? You know, we, we, as we have been studying in, in Sabbath school, you know, God remembers his covenant. He doesn't forget it. He remembers it. In Psalms 105 verse 8, he, it says this, He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. And as you know, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. And so God actively works to keep his people secure in him. He forgives us. He instructs us. He blesses us and strengthens us and turns us to righteousness. It is this evidence that really appeals to reason. In other words, if you don't have any evidence, why believe this person, right? God does not expect us to have faith in a stranger. Instead, he reveals himself through his son, through his scriptures, through the world of nature, through healing and transformation of lives and the cross on Calvary. I think that's the most compelling reason that we can anchor our faith. And so in this light of these revelations, this ample evidence about God or of God, we should choose to trust him, right? Amen? Amen. Faith is really an attitude. Faith is really an attitude but it's also a choice towards God. Having enough confidence in him based on the more adequate evidence revealed to us. To be willing to believe whatever he says, to accept whatever he offers, and to do whatever he wishes without reservation. And if you, and, and, if you and I have that faith, 
we are bound to heaven. This is from Sons and Daughters of God, page 25. It says, God's hatred of sin is as strong as death. His love for the sinner is stronger than death. Having undertaken our redemption, he will spare nothing, however dear, which is necessary to the completion of his work. No truth essential to our salvation is withheld. No miracle of mercy is neglected. No divine agency is left unemployed. Favor is heaped upon favor, gift upon gift. The whole treasury of heaven is open to those he seeks to save. Isn't that wonderful? That he will do everything possible. It's easier to be saved than to be lost. The third point I want to make is that the Filipinos made themselves to be saved. They knew that the invasion and recapture was imminent and was ready to defeat the enemy for their freedom when the time came. So my question is, are we ready for Jesus to come? And if not, how can we be ready before Jesus comes? You know, we need to be growing as Christians. Our lives should be progressive and incremental. You know, when we were in Thailand a few years ago, we met a pastor. Well, he told me that there's this really super prolific pastor who has all these baptisms. You know what he said? The secret to growing your church or having a ministry is to spend time in the Word. In other words, reading God's Word, praying, and sharing. So read, pray, and share. If you're not doing that now, you're not doing what God is telling you to do. We need to be growing. We need to be incremental. We need to be progressive. In other words, this pastor was leading a lot of people to Jesus because he was praying, spending time in the Word of God, and he was sharing his faith. Let's go to 1 Peter real quick. I'm, I'm sorry, 2 Peter. 2 Peter. I'm going to close with these verses because I think, you know, sometimes we read the Word of God and everything just goes over our heads and we don't remember it anymore. But as I read these verses um, recently, I was convinced that this is what we need to be doing as Christians. 2 Peter, beginning with verse 3, it says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse 5, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. And if these be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about this. It's a stepwise fashion that God is telling us in what we need to do as Christians and be fruitful in telling other people and sharing and leading them to Christ ultimately. But verse 9, it says, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather... Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fail. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right there, the prescription that God, God gives to us so that we can be effective, growing, incremental, progressive Christians. I stand before you this morning as a testimony to that promise that MacArthur gave 
over 80 years ago. I am thankful to your fathers. I am thankful to your grandfathers. I am thankful to your great grandfathers. However, how many levels go back? Because they sacrificed themselves in the liberation of my ancestral country. And I'm grateful that I can stand before you today expressing that testimony, the gratefulness that, that, that MacArthur did to my people. So it is my prayer this year that our trust in the living God will be more full than ever, as he has promised that he will come again. Amen. Father in heaven, yes, under your wings we can safely abide, safely abide forever. And Lord, thank you for that promise that you are coming again. And we want to be ready. We want to be growing, progressive, incremental Christians, telling other people about your soon return, telling, being active in the church. And Lord, we want to finish the work that you have commissioned us to do. So please, from here on, as we leave this church, help us to be the people that you want us to be. And we thank you. We come in Jesus' name. Amen.